Hello, everyone. We're back. It's another Friday. What a Friday it has been. I saw a man about a car. It was a whole thing. Uh, Elliot, you're here. Uh, we're very happy to have you. I hope you're doing well. Hope things are good. No, I wandered in. Well, I was wandering hither and thither, so to speak. You wandered in, and that's fine. You know, as as long as you find your way home. So we'll we'll, well I'm not very stormy though, so it's it's okay. I'm just wandering, <laughs> not storming. <laughs> yeah, uh, that is a good segue, as any, I guess, uh, into what we're talking about today. We're gonna be looking at um, a short little text. Uh, this was a a newspaper. Well, it was like a journal and article. Um, that uh, Carl Jung, famous Swiss um, psychologist, wrote back in 1936 uh, called, well, I guess in English, Wotan, or you would say Woden, probably. In German, it's Wotan, and um, Wotan in German, Woden in Old English, are just the different versions of the god uh, Odin. So different versions of the theonym, to use a fancy term. Um yeah, this is, I mean, we'll talk a little bit about the, the 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 journal article itself, but this is more of a jumping off point and perhaps a very awkward introduction into an idea that me and Elliot have been kind of kicking around over the past few months, people who have been watching the show. Thank you to our small yet loyal viewers. Um, have been, have been, here is sort of work, puzzle our way through, which is, um, you know, objective reality or objective spiritual reality aside uh are there more than one god uh you know in, in some ways the the to, to kind of catch people up or to remind people this really starts with um elliot and me discussing the um that one i think it was episode 11 of the daily wired um exodus series where uh mm -hmm. it actually wasn't jp it was uh very based uh jonathan Pajot from mm -hmm. french canada talking about um Perhaps there are more than one God. Perhaps more than one God exists, maybe not sort of above all worlds, but within the world. Maybe there are many sort of spirits, right? And they, they can interact with you transpersonally and that you can either choose to, you know, you could participate in them or resist them or that they you can invite them in or reject them. Um, so yeah, this seemed kind of like the natural next thing to discuss. Um, Carl Jung, I will say for, first off, I am not a Jung expert in any way, shape or form. So I will probably make mistakes in representing Jung's psychology here and his philosophy, but, um, so apologies for that ahead of time, but, you know, ultimately I'm not here today. Neither of us are here really to represent Jung. You can read Jung and lots of people who are far more knowledgeable in Jung, such as Jordan Peterson can, can fill you in far better than we ever could. We're using Jung as a jumping off point. We're using Jung as kind of like a thought germ or something like that to, to, to spark the imagination and take us to a place we maybe wouldn't be able to get to. Um, so the name of the journal article is Wotan in German, Woden, Odin. And it's kind of all about, this is written in 1936 from a Swiss person. So uh, Jung is writing in German here. I read the original German because why wouldn't I, Elliot? looked through the English because why wouldn't he? It's okay. It's fine. Translations are good. That's why they exist. Um, Jung is writing as a Swiss person looking to the north, to Germany, to see what's going on and sort of trying to psychoanalyze, at least is how I read this, what is happening in Germany. And what by that we mean, as people have said in other places, mid-century Germans uh, why are the Germans not seeing this way? What could be driving Germans to do these things that seem, in a very typical Swiss fashion, <laughs> Jung is basically saying, "Apps so bizarre and so over the top." Uh, Swiss, I don't know, uh, Elliot, if you've ever been to Switzerland, but Sw the Swiss are very regimented, in some ways, kind of like the Germans, but also way more, um, less extra. <laughs> kind of like so, I would. I would say it like this, the Swiss being, comma, being a mountain people, comma, or you could have N, letter N dashes is yeah. instead of commas. The, the being a mountain peoples find themselves necessarily separated from the rest of the world. And the Germans, comma, being a plains people find themselves thrown into the world, pun oh, intended. 
Well said. Well said. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting because although this, uh, I mean, me cracking into the original was fun. It's written in German. It's not a German perspective. Believe it or not, kids, there are other countries and other peoples in the world who speak German who are not German. It's a Swiss perspective, and it's a decidedly Swiss perspective, which is kind of cool. Um, he even calls out the Swiss, by the way, which I thought was pretty refreshing. Yeah. No, I mean, um, Jung is doing his, he's being chaotic in his own way. I mean, he's slicing all directions, I think, with this. Um He's, you know, looking at the, um, I mean, the, the title of the article is Wotan. So Odin, um, you know, the old English version is Woden. By the way, this is where we get Wednesday. Woden's Day, as in Mr. Wednesday from American Gods. Watch the, um, read the book. Maybe don't watch the show. The show has gotten, season three is rough. Season two was rough. Read the book. Um, Ian McShane is great as Mr. Wednesday. I will say that great casting the problem is the writing um regardless uh odin is probably how most people know this god now probably mostly because of you know the extreme popularity of things like thor the thor comics thor movies um but then also sort of the, the viking craze of the past roughly 10 years or so which i have as somebody who studies viking things i have somewhat mixed opinions about the pop culture explosion I, I don't know if it's helped the field any but odin right so when you hear wotan here when when carl jung talks about wotan fill in the blanks with you know odin um odin was uh, a very fascinating still is a very fascinating mythological figure um talk about chaotic neutral odin man a god of passion um in all senses of just unbridled um, hedonism on one hand, but on the other hand, a helper, right? A wanderer and a helper to those who perhaps need his help. Um, if this sounds, if the wandering aspect and the helping aspect of Odin sound familiar to some people, uh, and if it sounds a bit like Gandalf, that's not an accident. Um, Tolkien took kind of a lot of the good aspects of Odin and wrapped them up in the character of Gandalf. And by the way, Gandalf is one of Odin's many names in Old Norse. So that's kind of cool. Um, obviously, Tolkien's doing his own mythological project eh, and is, is, is essentially a, like purposely Christianizing uh, myth. Um, and whenever. But he's also sort of saving Odin in a certain saving way. Saving Odin. Yeah, he's, he's taking the good parts of Odin. He's baptizing Odin, you can say, in the, in the character of Gandalf. Literally, um, yeah. right? Because well, he could have well, he chosen splits, pure wanderiness. Well, he splits Odin into two characters, Gandalf right. and Saruman. And we've talked right. about Saruman before. Uh, so so Saruman embodies all of the negative qualities of I Odin. See. Conniving, um, crafty. That's what Siaru in Old English means. Saru, Siaru, crafty man. Um... So, but whereas Gandalf has sort of the, the wandering gray pilgrim, he's known to intervene when it's least expected, right? He helps, he turns the tide of a battle. So Odin is this kind of, is this fascinating mythological figure. Odin kind of becomes the god of war. Um, and depending on which sort of, depending on which pop culture universe is drawing from which version of odin from from the original myths you tend to see different sides of him sometimes he's a helper sometimes he's super conniving uh, sometimes and it's probably the more accurate depiction he's kind of both because that is what kind of you know if, when you read through uh, norse mythology and the various sagas where uh, odin appears uh he's sort of both he's a helper and also kind of on his own mission and also might kill you and also might sleep with your wife and give birth to some sort of demigod figure uh, he's doing all these things, and that's why you know Jung points this out in the uh, in the in the article. Um, Odin, he really is kind of a god of passion, of unbridled passion. Um, we don't mean passion in the Christian sense of like you know passion on the cross. We mean like in the older sense of like I am ruled by drives. I am ruled by drives, and I follow. I go where my drives drive me. Um, Being visited by muses is another great way, I think, of putting it. Yeah. Odin is sort of a god of excess. 
Um, he becomes a god of war, wasn't probably originally a god of war, although that's a minefield in Old Norse studies because I, so I have my own opinions about that, which I will gladly share here. Note that some people uh, who are very, very smart and wonderful people, um, I think even Jackson Crawford, who is a great, great guy, uh, love Jackson Crawford. He, he, he would probably disagree with this here. So if we have some crossover with his channel, this is just my take. Um, Odin doesn't originally seem to have been the total war god. And I may be, perhaps, perhaps Crawford has no disagreement with me on this. Um, it does seem that Odin, Odin is kind of a usurper. Um, and that's pretty well reflected in the mythology. Odin takes the mantle, the title of Allfather. Probably wasn't the original um, head honcho god. Um, in well, did Odin have a wife canonically? Well, there's different versions. Um, well, mm -hmm. th this is the problem. So this is the problem with doing any of this kind of stuff is you have the version of Odin as reflected in things like the poetic and prose edit, which are the records, right? Those are the that's what we have. And so you can kind of give the canonical version of everything. Right. But then there's this big caveat, this big, huge, it's not even a, a pinch of salt. It's a, a pound of salt that, you know, these are later records coming out of a Christianized era. And so it's difficult. It's difficult with Odin. Um, I, you, you, you know, you're left with things like you can make kind of etymological arguments about Odin. I'm more, I, <clears throat> I'm I'm more open to etymological arguments. I know a lot of people who in Old Norse studies are not. And that's that's fine, right? Like I, I think they have really good things to say regardless. I'm not trying to add anybody here. Odin, you know, Tyr, uh, Tyr prob I'm of the camp that Tyr was probably, if not the main god, a much higher, he was in a much higher level in the pantheon. Odin probably is a usurper. Um, and that's, you know, that happens as we've talked about um, when we've been discussing like Baal and uh, Asherah and other um, various Canaanite deities that you would have sort of competition, right? Between various cults, between various sects. We like our God, you like your God, whose God is going to win out? Um, you know, uh, Tyr, the name Tyr um, just means, it, it's one of the many words for deity, for God, supernatural, big dude in the sky or beyond the worlds, right? Um, Tyr sort of becomes uh, the god of like justice and of like correct action and following through on things. And this is also why Tyr gets his hand chomped, right? Tyr gets his hand chomped off because he's going to do the thing and he puts his hand in Fenrir's mouth and it's, spoiler, ends up losing a hand. Um, fun fact, um, we have a dog. I love my dog. And I clean my dog's teeth every night because I am that anal of a dog parent. Fine. You can call that cringe. I don't care. I love my dog. I want her to have a happy mouth, right? She's a dog. I love her. And so I have to clean my dog's mouth. My dog does not like her teeth brushed. And so every night I have to put my hand inside my large pit bull's mouth. And she's very gentle. She's very gentle. But I, I do like to joke with my wife, oh, Tyr is putting his hand in Fenrir's mouth because every night I'm like, here we go. Let's, are you going to follow the rules, dog? So, uh, you know, Tear, the tear story is fascinating. We could get into tear another day, but tear, there's there's indications that tear was the main god. Odin usurped that place, and re regardless if that's true or not, I think it follows based on everything we know about Odin, right? Everything that he, his established character traits, he kind of just takes what what's his, takes what he wants, and kind of doesn't give a shit about what anyone thinks. Does it cause problems for others? Totally. Does it cause problems for Odin? 100%. Can he change? Nope. He's living his best life, right? He's being the chaotic dude. The, the chaotic, I would argue that Odin is very chaotic neutral, does what he wants, takes what he wants. It could be good. Like, it's not always bad. Like, I for one like to think that giants are probably not great, right? Giants are not probably great. And uh, maybe you want a conniving all father who's going to maybe like keep the giants at bay, right? Perhaps. But the way he goes about doing it, right, obviously is completely, let's say, of a very different sort of moral grounding. Anyhow, Odin. Why am I talking so much about Odin? Because 
Jung's basic argument here is that Odin, or as he would say in German, Wotan, has resurfaced, right? Odin never went away. Um, Jung's argument here is that Christ never really truly defeated Odin in the minds of the Germans. And again, Jung's making sort of a, a quasi-nationalist argument here that the Swiss are very different from the Germans, and that's a whole other can of worms. But Jung's basic argument is that Odin has a, it was a sleeping god, much like Cthulhu, right? Odin was just asleep, like King Arthur, also kind of just asleep. You have these sleeping mythological characters, right? Odin was asleep and he has awoken. He is, he's, he's out and he's doing things. And in Jung's sort of defense of this idea, he points to the North, because again, he's writing from a Swiss perspective, and he's like, look at everything that's happening. And, and, and what Jung is saying is not that, is not that Hitler equals you, well, Odin. That's a ridiculous argument, which he's not making, and he's very clear about that. His point is that Odin, Wotan, is working, operating transpersonally across Germans and is driving them towards one goal, which is, you know, the first time I read this, I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? And that was like several years ago, right? I just heard about this crazy Jung Odin article. I was like, I'm going to read that, right? I was like, what are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. But in the past four or five years, there's, let's say, been some things that have happened. <laughs> Elliot, <laughs> you probably yeah, to right. Where people were driven towards things that kind of, they didn't even know why they were doing them. And you're like, well, why are you doing this? Why do you support this? Safety. Safety. Whoa. Okay. Or democracy. Weird concepts that nobody can really define. And yet everyone's driving and doing crazy things. I mean, cutting people out of their life, saying that people should be excluded from society, all this crazy stuff for, for, for nebulous concepts. And so over the past four years, some shit's happened. My perspective has totally changed on some things. So it's very interesting coming back to this text. I thought I knew it. I was rereading re it and I was like, oh, wait, oh, wait. I think I, I don't want to say I get it, right? Because I'm not a Jung expert, but I think I kind of understand the things that Jung is talking about, how there are sort of, you know, what Jung would talk about archetypes that sort of live in the minds of people and maybe they sleep in the minds of people. And if you get enough people together, maybe the right kinds of people, the right kinds of conditions, the archetypes can come out. So Jung's argument is- I would, I would call them like yeah. unexpressed memes. If you're familiar with the idea of an unexpressed gene that could potentially flip on and, yeah. and how there are epigenetic phenomena that, you know, the, basically the way in which you live so your you, life or what, what has happened- It's epimimetic phenomena. Yes, 100% epi epimimetic is exactly what I'm saying. And by the way, um, there would be some who would be who would who would point to Lawrence uh, or to Krauss as Woden, but I don't think that's true. I actually think that uh, Trump is a much more Odin figure uh, in in this. I think yes, he's much more in neatly the into that. The, it's the greatest. I just it's the these. We're gonna here's the thing. We're gonna get the giants to build Asgard. They're gonna build the wall and they're gonna build it at a, at a fraction of the cost. We got our man Loki on the inside wonderful guy i've talked to him many times and it, it, and this is the thing the giants are gonna i just got off the phone with loki he's joined the giants <laughs> yeah that wall just got giants. 10 feet higher yeah yeah this this betrayal will not go unanswered send truth he, social yeah <laughs> you know what i just looked down i just looked down at hail wonderful place wonderful people there but loki he's at the forefront he's leading the giants and the other very bad people <laughs> who are going to try to destroy us in Ragnarok, but it's okay. We know Loki's end. We know Loki's end. It doesn't go well for him. Doesn't go well for him. How, yeah. How's that bowl coming? Are you making that bowl right now? That's it's what very I thought. sad for Loki. I once heard he fucked a horse. By the way, that happens in Norse mythology. So yeah, once heard he had sex with a horse. His, the horse's name was Schlettner or Pussy. I don't really know, but it was yes. Anyhow, um, yeah, no, Trump's a very, has an Odinic quality to him for sure, because Odin's also a trickster character, right? It, as much as people like to say, well, Loki's the trickster. I'm like, yeah, Loki's like the chaotic bisexual trickster for sure in many respects. But but Odin is also, 
by the way, kind of doing some stuff that Odin engages in say their magic, which you're not supposed to do if you're a dude. And so he's also kind of gender bendy and, you know, he likes extravagance. And so, you know, Trump, Trump's got an Odinic quality to him. I can, I can buy that. But, you know, before we get so locked into the, you know, X equals Y kind of thing. Oh, of course, of course, that's of not course, what, of course. That's not, it's, that's not what Jung is arguing. And, here, right? Jung and, is saying and by Odin the way, is working across, it's not like Hitler equals Odin, Odin. It's that Odin is sort of alive and thriving because the Germans, whether or not they believe it, although as he quite rightly points out, there were actually a, a minority, but a very diehard minority of Odin worshippers involved in the Third Reich. It's fascinating shit. Um, yeah, and Third Reich, Third Reich occultism is frankly completely bizarre, even for so occult weird. circles. By the way, <laughs> like, we should say because of YouTube, it's evil. We don't like it. Everyone yeah, knows, yeah. It, but it is bizarre and it's fascinating in its bizarre quality. There was the um, um we've talked a little bit where Elliot, Elliot is the expert, has talked a little bit about you know uh, theosophy, uh, Madame Blavatsky, and all this stuff uh, a little bit on the show. We're going to get into that more in the upcoming weeks as we talk about the Ghostbusters people. It's going to be very cool. Um, but there was this weird, bizarre Arianosophy. I don't know if you've heard of that, Elliot, where they're like, no. it's theosophy, but for white people. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't I haven't looked into that. Like that's a sort of realm that because uh, I haven't heard about it. Thank God, right? It's really uh, cringe. It's really you, cringe. You, you got to be obviously. This is going to come up when you study anything. So you could uh, the the way in which this would come up is if you're studying like like you are doing with with the 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 history of Germany and stuff like that. That's where that would come up. Like. If you're chilling with like normal theosophists, like unless you were really driving in that direction and you're asking like, so yeah, tell me the history of the cringe elements. It's just not going to come up because, you know, theosophy was sort of one well, of the first, you know, one of the first transracial uh, Western yeah. based the, ideologies, I would say. The, the Arianosophists didn't like the theosophists because they were too inclusive. Yes. Big shot. Correct. Yeah. Well, right, right. And, and yeah. they, they still are quite inclusive in a lot of ways, although it ends up being kind of a, a white man's game because it's the solution to a white man's problem, honestly, right, uh, to, to a certain respect. And that makes more sense if you know what I'm talking about. But anyway, point being is that um, to your point, though, Colin, um, you know, uh, just to draw the lineage real quick uh, is that there's Blavatsky. She was wildly, she was wildly influential. Obviously, Nietzsche was aware of this, right? This is and, probably and why. Jung, sorry to interrupt, but Jung quotes extensively from Nietzsche in this article because he's using Nietzsche as an example of an unintentional or subconsciously Odin, Odinist person. Correct. Right. right. And in a completely different direction. Right. Right. And uh, Nietzsche's um, daughter or like one of his uh, like his, his cousin or some female chick um, was the reason basically why Nietzsche got so tied with the Nazis because she was a Nazi herself and said, oh, all my, you know, relatives work, you know, is is, you know, uh, totally is in line with with that that philosophy blah 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 so that's why that's why historically he gets so heavily tied to that regime because uh one of his family members sort of took him and ran and this was well after the point where he was really able to defend himself from this sort of attack you know the the classic Nietzsche photo that everybody knows about where he honestly kind of looks like he is disheveled a little bit it was her kind of propping him up frankly and it, it's a bit disgusting if i'm being honest but anyway not the point point is is that you know none of these people are are, are should be seen that we're bringing up should be seen as like instances necessarily of of odin however as 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 jung points out in this particular piece there are possessor gods and then there are gods who sort of take possession right and and i think that's a good potential setup you know i'll go ahead and spike the ball to you colin because i know that you're really excited to introduce this you know um there, there's two different types of of gods right that are sort of taking the worship and there's other ones that are sort of actively possessing people throughout the ages and that that possession may or may not be evil right we think right. about possession as um 
unilaterally well, evil, but the thing I mean, is, is that if you're Christian, being possessed by I'm the angels, opinion, it's not a problem. I'm of the opinion, I think probably more of the Eastern Orthodox would be more on board with this statement. I've, I've met some Catholics who are on board with it. A lot of Protestants really go bells and whistles crazy. They don't like it. But, I mean, spirit possession, um, Pentecost is coming up. Spirit possession. So in theory, all right, Christians the are possessed the by the spirit yes. of Christ. Period. If you're not, then Christ. you're fucked up, right? Like and a lot of Protestants go wee wee wah wah about that because they think of like heads spinning around and green vomit. Um, but that's a demonic possession, kids. Um, which is a inversion, oh, a perversion. Of notice what... that we had to clarify the type of possession there. <laughs> no, but you do have to because because right, like right, yeah, you have to. Um, but I mean, this is well attested in also in Judaism, right? Like the spirit of the Lord could come upon people, right? And and I mean, for, for Pete's sake, like if if something is inspired, right? Like this is an inspired work. We still use that today, maybe in more like, you know, mundane sense of like, oh, it's an inspired performance by, I don't know, Timothée Chalamet or something like that. I don't know. It's, it's positively inspired. Like somebody in the New Yorker will say that that comes right that's a dilution of of the original meaning of the word which is like it's it's possessed you're being you know the idea was that like various you know in a pre-christian period various gods essences of an art muses whatever would possess you and then you would be able to do beautiful things right or horrific and, and, things, and depending on who was possessing people, you uh, every epic poet would invoke right specifically um a muse right they'd be like hey muse of poetry please help me out here i'm trying to write an epic poem over here right so um yeah i mean so spirit possession i mean you don't have my point is you don't have to be pentecostals rolling down the hall the the, the aisles right to you don't have to be a holy roller to to get that um it's like i always like to say to anyone who will listen um at least speaking to the, the you know to the fellow frozen chosen who get all pearl clutchy um, us weird protestants it's like by the way you're all possessed by the spirit of christ get over it and baptism was an exorcism get over it it's what it, it is, is an exorcism by it's the an, way it's actually an, an exorcism and every easter when you reaffirm your baptism you renounce it's the same it's the same baptismal um um you know ren renunciation you know if it's just you're just saying it again to remind yourself so um th this is actually like most i guess the point we're trying to make here at least the point i'm trying to make here, and i think we're on more or less on the same page Elliot, is it like every culture throughout the history of humanity up until like the modern period has recognized that possession is real in the sense of possessed by a spirit or spirits of something and I think the point to bring it back to what we've talked about in a few, uh, you know, some episodes ago during the Daily Wire Exodus episode where Prager got all up in arms about this, right? And Pajot was like, but let's be honest, right? I think Pajot was definitely won that argument. He made a much better point. 100%. Um, 100%. Uh, like, you are possessed of things all the time, right? Are they good or are they bad is the question, right? Are, are, is it a beneficial possession? Is it, is it, a, is it a negative possession? Uh, you know, high emotions can change the way you act right you know we talk about crimes of passion passion everyone that that maybe it's not an excuse maybe but right but it's it's different right cold-blooded versus you know cold-blooded murder versus crime of passion right even in the legal system we at least uh, you know theoretically there's a distinction between these two things right um right like a bar fight is a lot different than mugging someone they're both bad right they're both violent but a bar fight, he said this one thing, this other guy said this other thing, they got in each other's face and there was a fight. Okay, that's a little different, right? Then just like, I cold, you know, I calculate the time to strike and I attack, a, you know, somebody who's not looking. Totally different. Even in a legal sense, we, 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 we recognize that there is a difference between these things. And maybe it's because in some, again, objective spiritual reality completely aside, let's set that aside for a moment. Just think about on a psychological level, right? assuming you can make such a distinction, but I'm talking to the, you know, I'm trying to bring in the cringe new atheists, like get a, get away from the crazy new atheism and, and think about it. You can be possessed of emotion, right? Strong emotion can make you act and does make you act in ways that you would never act normally. I mean, I've had experiences in my life 
both good and bad, both good and bad, where strong emotion allowed me to do things I wouldn't normally have done. And I have examples of negative, I have negative examples of that. I think a lot of people in a, high, in, in, a in a highly sort of um, masculine phobic society don't like men having strong emotions about anything. And so that tends to have like, oh, you're, you're violent. But there's been times too where I like just got angry and took care of things that needed to be taken care of. And, and, people, and, were, and people were happier for it because I got pissed. So, and the issue, yeah, there's it, there's quite a few things. Is this is normal, right? Like this, right. regardless of whether there's spirits jumping between people or not, functionally, we'll cycle back to that later. Functionally, is there a difference? As it presents itself in the world, is there a difference? And what's the sol what's the functional solution, right? Is the functional solution a dry, rational argument? At this point, what's 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 been very useful about the the last five to ten years, as certainly after like Gamergate, say, um, the new atheists have finally recognized that rationality is almost totally irrelevant. Yeah, um, and people like uh, Jonathan Haidt have have essentially kind of he makes a good case for it. Have kind of proven that like nobody's really rational and and Not obviously really. everybody knew this it was only a kind of weird blip in the kind of crowning sort of the crowning achievement of the 20th century to to finally uh, uh wind that argument all the way and i think that a lot of new atheists have now realized okay the, the animal spirits do at least functionally exist yeah. right and so it's time for us to start really contending at that mythological level yeah. and that's what somebody like say james Lindsay has started to do that's what jordan peterson certainly started to do of course i think peterson like probably knew this for a longer time but like you know he, well, he's peterson now also peterson if you if you listen to any Regard, I like Jordan Peterson. I know I kind of no, I'm, no, I do too. Across, I, I do come too. across to the show on the show that I rag on him a bit only because he gets he's just we're all a product of our generation, and it's just I, I have a thing about boomers sometimes. Um, I love them, but they drive me nuts. Um, well, he's a he's a lefty Canadian boomer, which yeah, is he, a different it, type it's of a different kind of thing. Yeah, but you know, Peterson also has had some very, I think they're genuinely meaningful experiences with First Nations Canadians from what right. he, i mean he's done a whole thing about the insane abuse stuff that happened at residential schools i mean it's by the way i don't normally do trigger warning i wouldn't recommend listening to those episodes unless you're really ready for it because it's rough is not like it's not it's they're good episodes but interviewing people it, it's in it's whoa. um i made a mistake of listening to that on a day where i was always already sad that was not a great decision. So uh, make sure you're in a good place before you listen to that. But it's important to listen to. And, you know, and obviously there's a lot of darkness there. But um, Peterson strikes me as somebody who's genuinely interested in how, um, you know, he, he has this perception of being very pro-Western because he is. But he's also very open to other cultural viewpoints of, deal, you know, of dealing with trauma and things like that. Obviously, he's a psychologist. Um, and he he's somebody, I think, who has had some very meaningful and beneficial relationships that he's built with First Nations Canadians. And I think he I think he just sort of also being a Jungian kind of gets the importance of like a connection to nature. Right. And that nature can have a spirit or multiple spirits and that they can mean something for somebody and they can mean something for a culture and that they can be a way to kind of put things back together in a certain way. So I think that there's that, too. Yeah. Sorry. That was just keep going. Just no, 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 no. Well, so so. Um, actually, I think this is a perfect time to maybe do a tiny bit of what I, I mean. I also say this because you're also because you're from Alaska, and there's in a fair you know, Alaska has a, a higher well, Alaska doesn't really have people, but there's a higher population, right? Of Alaska natives, right? So, that, and that, that's more of a thing in Alaska than it is in a lot of other states. So, that's only that, well, that's right. my then, yeah, yeah. Right. And I don't, you know, the funny thing is I don't really need to listen to that episode because yeah, I know all the details, right? <laughs> like you know the um, details. It's rough. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, yeah, yeah. It's 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 rough on all sides, by the way, right? Obviously, there's a European side to the roughness, but then there's also um, you know, a uh I just re listened to somebody um on a different podcast. I think Kong, you gave this podcast to me which was that one with the funky boat going over the edge of the thingy thing, whatever. Um, that has been a very good podcast. 
Um, you can be more specific. Anyway. I sent you so many things. <laughs> well, no, no, hold on. I'll, I'll look it up real quick. But okay, point yeah. being is basically, basically like I totally, I totally get where that's, where that's uh, coming from. Because again, it's, it's, uh, you know, um, in, in the Alaska context, uh, just like the Canadian context, it's a far North situation. And essentially a lot of there, I'll say it like this, there's more than one disease that uh, came over from Europeans right and one disease that came over was alcohol right now i'm not saying alcohol is a disease what i'm saying is like you know when it hits your society and you've literally never had it for like multi-generations yeah um it can really wreck your shit especially when it's concurrent with the complete demolishment um uh, decimate literal decimation on every front of that word right uh, of your culture that just does not allow for synthesis of new ideas. So we already stressed, and then you add on disease and alcohol, it's like not going to be a good time. And then of course, a huge technocracy, yeah. uh, imperialist technocracy that is looking to grind everybody to a paste. And then of course, World War II fucks everything up, right? In terms of like everybody, you know, the, obviously the Japanese take center stage in terms of the internment camps, but there is definite native to internment camps too. Oh, right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it, it gets pretty bad. Um, so it's interesting, right? Because on uh, on the West Coast, we um, feel a lot more um, in our bones, that sort of European side of World War II, that European experience much more than the East Coast guys do, I think, because I'm, I'm you know, maybe they had internment camps over there, but we certainly had them over here. And, and that, that was, kind of is more of a West living thing. memory. There, it's it's you know, a living there, memory type of thing. Yeah, there, there, there's a living. I mean, you can do, you can go to places too, like um, near Seattle, Bainbridge Island, had a thriving, mm -hmm. really thriving American Japanese, but really American community of people who were, you know, had maybe parents were from Japan, and that's all gone, and that's that's all gone, and that's not just random. That was no, it's, it's, it's that very was FDR. That was FDR just. <laughs> Removing. Well, and you can you can see the the intentional capital P progressive, and then later descendants of woke ideology, right? right? Yeah. Um, really intentionally trying to atomize. You know, uh, yeah. again, Lindsay talks about the ironclad law of woke projection, right? And it's true that they they um, the wokes will say, and the progressives will say, "Oh, libertarians and right wingers are trying to atomize people as they are actively atomizing everyone." Right. So, just to be clear, right, and that isn't to say that right wingers or libertarians are pro collectivism, right, as a as an ideology. It's just that we're realistic in saying, "Hey, there are natural hierarchies in nature, namely the the, the family and the tribe, right, the family of families, if you will, um, and and these things help to stabilize cultures and societies and we saw, like, I mean, it's like in the documents where the strategy was to defamiliarize, right? De in the literal sense, un these, unfamily, to unfamily. Right. Yeah, yeah. Correct, right? Like, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it, so, 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 you know, that's kind of, that's kind of that, like, actual history there. But, you know, yoga is really interesting, right? right? Because he is one of these figures who doesn't really spawn a school of thought per se. So I would say Jung sits at this funky pivot point, inflection point, if you will, um, between what I would say is like the old world view of what psychology would turn out to be and the new world view, because Jung um, is a bit parallel to Freud. Like Freud was kind of the first guy to kick it off as a, as a field of study. And I think Jung was uh, part of actually an older tradition um, uh, uh, emer you know, sort of emerging into the new hyper post enlightenment world, where um, obviously there's a lot of bean counting and categorization, right? But he sort of makes explicit what was a lot of times properly occult knowledge, um, and he kind of injected it into the mainstream. So I learned yeah. about Jung first through Alan Watts, who is also oh, a popularizer. Yeah, of, of and he talks about Jung a lot and very deeply. And, for, you know, Alan Watts is one of these guys who's talking to psychologists, in my mind, the good psychologists who are sort of um, psychology, especially in the 50s and 60s, I think was the last vestige of a program 
from what I could see, which was to try to synthesize industrialization and shamanism together, right? So I would say that Jung is like um, the Enlightenment era shaman, right? Not in the Blavatsky Wu way, but in sort of this middle point between science and Wu and between the old world and the new world, well right? Well it, said, middle point between science where, and Wu. Right. Is, that's where Jung happens. So all scientists will read him and be like, what the fuck is this guy even saying? Because I haven't studied enough occult stuff to really get all the depth that he's saying, either occult or mythology, a little bit of both, right? Uh, simultaneously, the Wu people might be a bit confused about why he is saying the things in this certain way, but it's because he is, if not explicitly thinking himself to be a scientist, certainly um, you know, a, a kind of full member of the science as it was at that time before it got like massively mathematized, uh, not mathematized, but quantized, right? In, in terms of a, like a financial quant or quanta, right? Quantum, right? Like, you know, basically the quantum revolution forced um, science, I think, at a very deep level to become more arithmetic based and less geometric metric based. Whereas before this time, math had been far more of a geometric pursuit with some arithmetic on the side as needed. In fact, the, 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 the word clever was never, we hear clever and we think, oh, this person's really smart and sharp, but clever was seen as sort of a, uh, you know, I looked this up anyway, and it was seen in the 17 and 1800s as much more of a, uh, duller version of being smart right it was like oh yeah yeah you know you're do you're doing sort of uh, uh mental parlor tricks right like they would have said a calculator that is to say somebody who's good at arithmetic is clever but they wouldn't have said that they're a genius right we in our current era actually have a less good understanding of intelligence in my opinion because we frequently confuse uh, ability to calculate right uh, and bean counting and accounting with uh, true intelligence, right? Yes, you see what I mean? Like it's, yes. it's, it's, it, we've actually regressed in our understanding of these things. And so just, if you do read this, when he is saying clever, he's not really thinking what you're thinking, which is, oh, that really smart math guy. It, it's sort of in the negative sense, actually, a little bit of like a smart person who's a big brain, but not really seeing the big picture, right? Yeah, and I mean, Jung also quite in a wonderful quote, if I may, this is becoming that, it's becoming a live reading channel, but that's okay. Uh, you know, it, can, can I read a quote? Is that okay? Go ahead. Well, no, uh, no, it's a quote. See, we we have never read a thing from start to finish, so it doesn't count. We should, we should <laughs> just do that in the style of one of our favorite slash not favorite podcasters and just like shill for money the whole time in Patreon, so. Oh my goodness! Actually, we, you know that'd be so so boring for both of us though, because we have to interrupt <laughs> we just every get other. Up and just start talking and like, let's have well, a that's the issue, right? Yeah. Like, neither of us are able to interrupt, it, it, despite the fact we interrupt each other. We're not able to interrupt and then herd her like stupid reference, right? Yeah. Like anyway. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> like, so I'm gonna I'm gonna read this in German and English if that's okay, just because the, the the quote in German is so great. If that's mm -hmm. okay. I'll follow up with the trans uh, with the translation. Well, the audience has no say, so fuck the audience. Yeah, um, fuck. No, we love you. Guys. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, you spend fifteen years doing the language. You might as well use it for something cool, right? So that's what I say. Uh, okay, so this is from uh, Wotan. Wotan by by Jung. Deutschland ist ein geistiges Katastrophenland, wo gewisse Naturtatsachen immer nur einen Scheinfrieden mit der Weltherrscherin Vernunft eingehen. Okay, great quote in German. Let's the English, you know, this is the translation, but it's so much better in the German. Germany is a land of spiritual catastrophes where nature never makes more than a pretense of peace with world ruling reason. And I think okay, actually, what could you reread the German again now that we have the English in our heads? Yeah. Deutschland ist ein geistiges Katastrophenland, wo gewisse Naturtatsachen immer nur einen Scheinfrieden mit der Weltherrscherin Vernunft eingehen. I mean, you could, if you, you could basically pick out the words. Like the, the cognates are in fact cognates there. I'll just yeah. say it like that. Um, I will say Deutschland ist ein geistiges Katastrophenland. And Germany is a land of, of, of spiritual catastrophes. It's such a wonderful quote. It's one of well, my favorite quotes. It's, it's, so it's, it's, 
it's it's very true and and um you know uh is that all one word in german which one katastrophenland uh, a land yeah, uh, catastrophe yeah, land yeah. is what it means right catastrophe land like literally yeah. like and of course you know there's not this like oh well native americans had 120 word one words for snow but like because that's 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 fake in the same way that yeah german also has 120 words for snow but that's just how like fucking word synthesis yeah. works you know yeah. what i mean like come yeah. on guys it's dumb right but 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 uh in in this german case like it does like it is nice to be able to sit with like oh no it's not two words modifying each other in a certain way you get to have this beautiful blended word of that's like why, that's why i say the german language. is so beautiful it's so beautiful it's so well written mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. again don't don't let As somebody who like it, very they, mildly written, knows german right and don't let the, the fact that it's written in german confuse you this is a swiss perspective this is not german this is swiss yeah <laughs> like like well this, and and yeah, and I think it, yeah. I think it's accurate. I think it's accurate, though, and to, to to address the quote directly, right? Because um, this gets back to why I say Germans should not be allowed to do philosophy, right? Amen. Because because they are a uh, 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 spiritual uh, Katastrophenland. Right? Geistiges, like, geist, yeah, uh, geistiges Katastrophenland. Yeah, <laughs> geistiges Katastrophenland. You are banned from philo philosophy. Right yeah, until you know. <laughs> your get your 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 theology, right? Your, yeah. your, your I think uh, you know. I think theology. As we were talking about last night, I think Germans should be allowed to do theology. I think they should be allowed to do music. Um, cars, great. Um, buses, trains. You know, engineering, engineering yeah, all that good stuff. Science, medical. But science. Until they get their spiritual <laughs> self fitted out, until they have figured out how to re re enthrone tear. Uh, over Odin, uh, they're just not ready for it. <laughs> Perhaps. Perhaps. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They just, no, no more German philosophy, please. Uh, please. Please. Y'all are fucking it all up. Look you know, at this you. This is my stance. You, you could be like, oh, no, that was 20th century. Like fucking Clash Schwab, dude. Clash no, Schwab. Uh, fucking... Adorno. Adorno. Yeah. Adorno. Fucking Adorno. Fucking... Yeah, uh, Marcuse. Mm. Marcuse. Marcuse. Yeah, fucking hell. Like mm. it's mm. Yeah. Mm. the Frankfurt School. The like Frank fucking, it goes on. Frankfurt School. Yeah, they exactly. they they maintain this shitty that just needs to stop. Stop. Well, and, <laughs> and as as you know, um, we hope to have him on the show soon. Marshall, you know, as Marshall would, say, you know, Marshall talks a lot about Near Lothotep, and I basically determined that Hegel probably was an avatar of Near Lothotep. <laughs> an avatar, not just influenced. Yeah, no, he is an avatar. Like he was a incarnation of Nirlathotep. And so uh and it's all gone downhill from there. So yeah. Um, um so so the, the other Swiss, the other sort of allow the Swiss, you know, I actually kind of, they know their kindred. I will allow the Austrians as well. But there's something about oh, sure. there's something about Sid Sherman's and the philosophy, and I don't know what it is. Maybe it is the Hegel, maybe it is the, the water. I don't know there's something and it's cool to see somebody in 1936 point this mm -hmm. out <laughs> mm -hmm. something's really off here <laughs> anyhow but the 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 other sort of thing about Jung that's that's because again he is not fully magical he's not like an Aleister Crowley in a neutral no. sense right yeah, like yeah. you know even neutrally he's not an Aleister Crowley um, you know, he's not a Freud, right? He is literally the mid middle pillar of the two, right? And and so from a from a from a, a tarot perspective, right? I kind of when I see Woden and I hear him described by Jung, it it, it it's very easy to to make this very tiny leap in my mind of saying, oh, it looks like Odin is a cross between um, in in the uh, in the major arcana, right? Uh, he is the nine, the hermit, right, which is a wandering hermit with a little lantern and a star in the middle. Uh, so he is a hermit, which actually totally fits in because, again, that star is a six pointed star, like very importantly. Right. And, and actually uh, in European um, tarot tradition, it's totally possible that this wandering hermit was perhaps an explicitly Jewish person. But also he's wearing the gray robes, right, the hooded robes of. Wotan, right? So freaking straight up Odin, I think, is one instance of, because I think Jung would say that all of these different gods are in some ways uh, sort of downstream of the much larger egregores of these, um, 
you know, of, of the, uh, potentially he would say this anyway, uh, of these uh, sort of um, uh, uh, tarot style, like the, 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 the nine, the wanderer. And then also um, there's another card that was coming to mind too. And I will, I will cut in with it at some point, but, but That's yeah, right. it, look yeah. at, consider, consider the, the hermit for the nine uh, of, of the major arcana. Um, and I think you'll kind of get what I'm saying there. Yeah, no, and that's something that I need to read up on. That you are you are the tarot person here. Um, again, at the risk of becoming a live reading show, there's another <laughs> great quote that I think kind of also will will take us onto the next point, or that will help us sort of the, it will provide us an übergang. There's some more German, a transition, if you will, um, if I may. Okay, so this is a little bit later, um, and this you know I don't need to well, why not read it in German? It's probably okay to read it in German, right? I don't know. Fuck it. I'll just read it in English. People don't come here for German. Um, this is this is a point. This is on pay, uh, Elliot for your purposes. This is on one eighty nine in the uh, English mm. translation. All human control comes to an end when the individual is caught in a mass movement. The archety- then the archetypes begin to function. And again, for t- for uh, Jung here, archetypes fill in the blanks. Spirits, right? Gods, something like that. Then the archetypes begin to function as happens also in the lives of individuals when they are confronted with situations that cannot be dealt with in any of the familiar ways. So with this, I mean, I, this is very on the nose. Like everything that the Germans, the Germans were doing before is not working anymore, right? Like the post, the post, post-World War I Germany can't, they can't do things the same way. And so this awakens something within. And all of a sudden, you know, maybe not all of a sudden, but it probably felt a bit like that, right? Um, he, he says here, it's not just that individu- all individual, he doesn't say all individual control comes to an end. He says all human control. Right. Um, right. And I'm just gan- glancing at the German here. Um, and that's actually, yeah, it's in the German as well. Menschliche uh, Regulierung. So it's it, So that's a good translation there. Um, again, sorry, I read it in the original. I'm having to catch up here in the English, but, uh, um, but yeah, no, like he's not saying individual control goes away. He's saying human control, which implies that there's something else at work here, which is almost like these archetypes. Maybe they are not supernatural paranormal. Maybe they are just parts of the human, but they're so much a part of the human, right? That they're not even human anymore. There's something much deeper and they're taking control. Humans are no longer in control. Something else is right. Different. And I think, I mean, it, we're talking about spirit possession. What is that if not a functional definition, at least psychologically? I have to say this like JP, what is that if not a functional psychological definition of spirit possession? I mean, what is? That's pretty on the nose. Well, and notice it's very, and, and, and I kind of get a, uh, a notion of like emergent phenomena more generally, but specifically think about how magnets work, right? Magnets literally work, right? Uh, uh, even permanent magnets, because all, at every level of resolution, the, el- the magnetic fields are all aligned in the same direction, which then defines the North and South Pole, right? And so this is, this is sort of saying um, humans have lost control, right? So every level of the human cybernetic ability has gone so both the individual familial governmental and and you get a mass movement once you've gotten this mass movement through sort of a phase space type of thing for my physics people um these archetypes start to appear and it's sort of like this um there are think about it in in two different ways right so think about like mean girls how there are those archetypal groups right (laughs) And our protagonist, uh, which is a not quite yet destroyed Lindsay Lohan, um, right. you know, comes in and she is a, a total outsider. She is a, an uncarved block, so to speak, into this whole thing, right? And she is introduced to the archetypes, right? And the archetypes only exist because they are grouped together, right? So. What does a nerd mean? Well, if you had a nerd who was fully synthesized into a different group, right? Like their primary, um, their primary uh, persona 
right, is is a part of the other group, right? So think about like the smartest jock. That guy's going to be a quarterback at that point, right? Because the smartest jock is that guy calling the shots, the team captain. Now, if the jock was Line, also, by the way, Elliot, I have to correct you. Uh, offensive linemen tend to be the smartest, but we'll 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 for purposes of of, of metaphor, we'll we'll let it slide. So keep going. Nope, fair enough, fair enough. Dude, that's legit. That's legit. Of course, I don't know football. That personal well, so experience, there you go, but. As no, no, actually, so, so, <laughs> so, so uh, but but actually, okay, so but but even it was regardless, okay, we won't regardless. That's very Sorry, fascinating. I had to. No, 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 it's no, it's good, it's good because actually the metaphor could continue, but regardless, then you take that offensive lineman and say they sneak off in the in in the in the you know in the sneaky sneaky times, right? And they go hang out with the nerds, all of a sudden they're a completely different person within the nerd group, oh, but yeah. all of that nerdy energy creates a different grouping right so so it's sort of the hierarchy changes but also the sort of uh there, there's a sense in which a nerd nowadays right if you transported them back in time to a 1950s nerds would be feel at home same thing with all sports people yeah. how is it that there is this intertemporal character between the jocks and the nerds and i just use these two for extreme examples because they're really clear it's also really clear how there's nerdy jocks and jockey nerds right like yeah. just to be very clear but like you know um this i was a nerdy jock archetype. i think i was a nerdy jock nerdy jock was probably right. What it was. yeah right so so all of these archetypes right only start to exist when you have a critical mass of the people who would make up that archetype and they all start going in one direction and all of a sudden you get thoth emerging out of this nerd right or you get like loki emerging out of the nerds right or you get thor emerging out of the jocks or or yeah, whatever is totally case a jock yeah, right. yeah, yeah. You know, a good hearted jock, too. And you could also have, you know, uh, you know, some 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 nefarious or dudes, you know, but but regardless, Odin, point Odin, being, Odin is spawned out of the bad boys. The bikes. Right, right. Yeah. Right. The, the, you know, so 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 these these sort of spiritual entities, so to speak, and I say spiritual, maybe astral entities would be another way or really, honestly, uh, it gets all the way up to ethical and supernal, if you know what those things mean, right? These entities really do start emerging once you have these groups of humans that are uh, not so personally self-controlled, right, that they are kind of forming themselves into the group, right? Like a really great way of thinking about it actually is all of those 1980s toy um, selling, uh, you know, sort of sort of Power Ranger type shows where all the people come together, they all have their own tiny mech suit, but then they literally fit together into a bigger right. mech suit. That's all we're talking about. Yeah. That bigger mech suit is the, the deity in this case, the shining one, right? Yes, yeah. <laughs> No, well said. Uh, as somebody who lo who loved Power Rangers as a kid, who didn't, uh, and had those toys. Uh, of course, everyone had them. They're great toys back when they really made toys. Uh, yeah, they're a lot of fun. No, that's a wonderful metaphor. Uh, that's a wonderful metaphor. Um, yeah, and you know, it's interesting. I don't know if you noticed, Elliot, in the English mm -hmm. translation. I'm looking at it here. They still there's words that there's there, there's a word there's a few words that they kind of can't translate. They just throw it, throw it in in German. I was super annoyed about that, but yes, of yeah, course. Yeah, I don't, and, and I kind of feel <laughs> for the translator. It's, translation's hard, man. It's difficult. I get it. I get it. Um, especially in German. There's a lot of funky shit. So. Especially every language. Yeah, so there's this term, ergriffenheit, and right. various derivations on it. So ergreifen is the verb. There's ergreife. So ergriffen is like to seize or to be seized, to seize something and this like is what that. i was talking about earlier yeah and then so then the there's the same thing right and even in the english they use these german words so ergreife is the person place or thing doing the seizing in this case it would be Wotan, odin and then there's this broad kind of category term ergriffenheit which i would translate something as like on on on, on, on a quick dirty translation of it would be something like to the 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 state of being possessed probably in this context by someone or something um and I, it, to be the, the 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 state or condition of being seized by something not in it like seize up i didn't oil myself i just stopped moving it's not like that it's like something is seizing you um right. to be yeah. grabbed in, although honestly a seizure yeah. like that is probably the same thing right well, I mean that, and that's what, and that's what Odin is doing. Botan is doing, right? He's seizing. 
an entire nation in this case, and really in, in a way through ripple effects, an entire world, uh, right? Like, uh, mm -hmm. spoiler, <laughs> spoiler. Um, and that's interesting. It's interesting also that like they, they just didn't choose to translate it, but it's also that a Griffinheit is this is this quality or condition of being seized by something. And it's not um it's not a it's not even a like tempting, hey, don't you want to kind of come over do this thing? It's like a no in German that I mean that means like grabbing and holding and like yeah, like, think, now, think more about like, like legion in the Bible, right? Yeah. Like uh you know, it's it, I'm maybe he did some hanky panky. Maybe he just pissed off a local sorcerer and they and they fucking seized him. Who knows, right? Don't know. Like, but it's interesting because this uh, Griffin height, this this quality of being seized, um, is connected to what Jung calls the national god, um, or the the national god, or as he says here, the nationalist god. Uh, that's one of the translations, but. The national god is maybe the better translation, the god of the nation. And, you know, the god of the nation does not need to be, need not be a god that is regularly recognized by an established religion. Right? Well, and, and, you know, it could and more be importantly, kind of god. it could be the god of nationalism, right? Or potentially, and, and, and this is where, well, you know. And this is, well, sorry, if I may. Go ahead, go ahead. If I may. We need to get him on the show. It's okay. It didn't work this week. We will get him on the show. As a good friend Marshall would say, I mean, this is Demos. And Demos is a jealous god. Demos is a hungry god. The national god, of, I would argue that, you know, that maybe the national god of, uh, of Germany at this time was really Odin. I think Jung makes a pretty strong argument for that. And so it got me thinking. I wrote in the margin. I do my own marginalia. I'm a medievalist. We do marginalia. I was like, "De nationale Gott in den USA, demos." Right. I I write notes to myself in German when I'm reading in German. But I was like, in the United States, the, who is our national god? It's something like demos right now, the god of democracy, right? Which is kind of like the god of consumption and churning and like the masses, the mass power. And we just get enough and it's, you know, it's literally might makes right through through just sheer numbers, the God of sheer numbers, something like that. Um, maybe that's just me. And I think Marshall would agree with that. But I, I don't know, Elliot, I feel like you might agree with that, too. Like Demos seems to be something like the national God that's gripping America right now. Who is seizing us? Who is gripping us? Demos? Moloch? Are they the same thing? I don't know. Um, hard to say. Well, that you know? and, and there's a there, there's there's a and, and and so where i like so there could be there could be say a father god of the nation a father god not the father god a father god of nationalism right of which there are spin-off brother and sister or, or uh, daughter and, and 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 son gods of each particular nation those gods could be the the straight up child you know the straight up children of nationalism but and then what right and then what well uh in in many different cases actually there's lots of different gods by which you know this this uh, you know potentially it could it, it would need to usually be a a a male female pair to kind of make everything work right so in this case it would probably be a feminine god right who is is maybe pairing up with both right and all of a sudden we have technocracy right uh right techne, the, the, the god techne techne right exactly techne. right yeah. yeah it could be it could be demos and techne or demosia yeah. or whatever you know um and and that creates the technocracy right um same thing with you know and of course one could go through the sex lives it's entertaining one should so yeah no it's it, it is it's it's just it's fascinating because the like, so many people are talking this is this is this is totally not elliot and me our own unique idea. I mean, it's our own unique take on this, but so many people are talking about this, at least in our general ideological sphere or roughly around there, right? You get people like Pajot talking about transpersonal entities and, you know, things like that. He has his own very Eastern Orthodox take on it, which I find fascinating. I, I don't really know much. I still don't, it's so hard to understand Eastern Orthodoxy. I just kind of listen to it and go, okay, I experience it. I try, try not to understand too rationally because it's a different way of doing theology. Um, 
Well, as, a, I, I, as an Alaskan, <laughs> right, I can I kind of actually sort of appreciate oh, Eastern you're Orthodoxy. Russian. You're very Russian. Well, well it's well, in, in multiple different directions, right? Because I think Orthodoxy fits um, extreme environments better in yeah, a lot of ways, probably. right? Firstly. Secondly, and, and there's or, two reasons for that. 100%. And the reason why I say that is, is multiple, but, but just think about it. Like what is the medium is the message in a certain way. Right. And the nature around us is the fundamental medium that we're stuck with. And if you're isolated, right. An orthodoxy is, is only, is, is kind of the only way, right. Whereas if you're having to be constantly checking in with mother church all the time, right. It, it's much harder for the Catholics to even get there, so to speak. Right. Yeah. In one sense. Then the other sense is that, um, uh, uh, in an almost a totally opposite direction of, of kind of proving this point is that Alaska, in, in being part of the United States nation, is certainly American in temperament. It's not Canadian. Very different than Canadians in a lot of ways, but very the same as Canadians. It is the only Arctic America, firstly. So it's unique in that sense. Right. And then secondly, it is separated or sacred, in my opinion, from America. Right. Well, and so there's this sense in which Americans or where Alaskans see themselves as Americans. But it's one of those states where you see yourself as Alaskan first. Right. Well, and then like, secondly. Yeah. Oh, and then secondly, um, uh, there's a sense in which like America influences, but is not really the center stage. It's kind of over there. Right. And so in that sense, orthodoxy is, is I think, similar. Right. Uh, from from a Western perspective, right, which which is sort of fundamentally centralizing based off of you know Catholicism, right, and but the yeah. Protestantism started to decentralize a little bit, but but Orthodoxy has always been in some ways decentralized, right. Okay. So so there's a sense in which like the intuition is there. If you're from an extremophile place, a place on the extremity, right, I think the Orthodox mentality just kind of makes sense. In, you know, in my mind, anyway. No, I mean it's it's interesting. You know, uh, I learn a lot about Alaska from from talking to you. And I hear Elliot. You know what I've heard? I've mm. heard some things. I've heard you can see Russia from your front porch. Yeah, well, you know, actually, that was Tina Fey's line. That was SNL slander. Not that I like uh, Sarah Palin, by the way, because she was still fucking funny. cringe. It's but still but funny. it's hilarious. It's hilarious. And actually, there is a part of Alaska that you can see from Russia. It's still funny. Uh, yeah, on a good day. But but well, yes, you, you yes, brought yes. up you know two Tina Fey ref, uh, two Tina Fey references in one in one thing, right? You get Mean Girls as well. So maybe we're I don't know we're the the the, the logos is getting <laughs> us in strange places today. Um, <laughs> one thing too, and maybe this is a, a good sort of not, not that this has to be the final point, but this is perhaps my final point. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of you know later in the the, the, the latter part of the article. Jung talks a lot about this term, you know, about God or gods and stuff like that. He uses this term, Gott in German, God in English. Um, and it's interesting because um, all nouns are capitalized in German. So you just have this term Gott popping around. And he could be referring to the, you know, to 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 Yahweh, the 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 or to just Wotan or Dionysus or whoever, right? Like, and it's interesting because um in the English translation, the translators, again, translation is a difficult job, is having to make a decision. Do I capitalize or, you know, God or not? Because just mm -hmm. a different orthography system, a different spelling system in English. And it, there's a religious connotation in English when you capitalize the G in God, right? Mm -hmm. It's interesting that in the original, that doesn't exist. It's sort of, it's all through context and it's pretty clear. But that, that little bit of ambiguity in the German got me thinking about the term God um, as a term. And it's interesting because, you know, people will say, don't you believe in God or do you believe in God? And I mean, a Hindu would probably say yes. But probably in a very different way from a Jew, probably in a very different, who would be in a probably different way from a Christian, definitely from a different way in a Christian, than a Christian, who would definitely have a different understanding than a neo-pagan, would definitely have a different understanding than, you know, fill in the, than, than, than a Muslim, who would definitely have a different understanding than, right, so... It's this thing like, don't you believe, do you believe in God? It's like, well, God is a, it's a category, right? And for better or for worse, for better or for worse, in Christianity, right? Even in, this is in the New Testament as well, right? Like the, 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 the Greek term theos, right? Which just kind of means God, like a God, is used for God in the Christian sense. Well, and in the Jewish sense as well, right? Um, that's interesting. 
it's I don't I don't fault them for doing that, but it also kind of muddies the water just a little bit, right? Because obviously it's clear what Jews and Christians in Greek are doing. They're elevating the concept of God to God, right? To they're to monotheist, monotheistic religions. But in and of itself, God is just kind of a category, right? So the question always comes down to kind of, and this is a little bit of Carlisle too, right? Like who who is your God? What's your religion? Who is your God? That's what matters. Do you have God or not in our increasingly cringe new atheist age? Maybe that's a more and more, you know, important question, but it's kind of like you kind of can't help but have a God. So what is your God, right? Um, to say, I believe in God, to me, I'm always like, okay, and what do you mean by that? Maybe that's just the religious studies scholar in me. I'm like, okay, and what do you mean by that, right? Because you can have discussions with you know, you can have fascinating, fruitful discussions with people of various religious backgrounds, and they'll talk about God, and you realize, as somebody who's, you know, if you're of one tradition, you realize, okay, they're using this term, right, and it means something different than I mean, right, because and this is this because is where God the... is, is kind of a concept, but it's not an identity, or it's not a, it's not a person, it's not an identity or persona, right, and this is making me, I had this realization in the shower, as I tend to do, that okay, that makes sense. Why there in Judaism there's a um, prohibition on uttering the tetragrammaton, the true name of God, even though I've already done it. But I'm Christian, you know, you're not allowed to say that aloud except in certain very narrow situations. At least in the old school, you know, ancient Israelite version of the religion, because that's actually God's actual identity, right? Because God is a con is a term, and this also makes sense too to tie it all back around. And I will see the floor shortly, Ilya, but this is the point to what we've talked about previously this sort of spring, um, how, you know, you have Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And in Genesis 1, it's Elohim, right? In Genesis 2, it's Yahweh all of a sudden. That's interesting. We've talked a lot about that. Um, but Elohim is sort of, it, I know that this isn't a translation from the Hebrew, but this is an interpretation of the Hebrew, right? Oh, Elohim is a concept. We're talking about conceptually God is creating the world, right? But that's a very out there concept. That's like, you know, somebody saying, well, I believe in God. And I also, you know, and, you, and lots of people can say that and have very, very different interpretations of what they mean by that. But in Genesis 2, you have Yahweh, who is the personal God of, of humans, right? Who's creating humans to be in his image. And that's a very different thing. And I do think that that ties back into this, where... I think Jung is playing in the German with the ambiguity with the term Gott, because again, it's always going to be capitalized in German because it's a noun. And so it's like, well, what God are we really talking about here? Right. And I think that's what he's interrogating here. He's like, who is the God? Because he's talking about, you know, German, the Deutsch, you know, the Deutsch and Christen, the German Christians who were kind of like during the Nazi period, who were kind of just like, oh, of course we believe in God. And he's kind of like Christ. He's also kind of like Odin. He's kind of like, you know, Baldur and whoever we want to be. Well, of course we believe in God. And it's like, well, you don't believe in the God of the New Testament or the Old Testament, definitely not the Old Testament, but not even the New Testament. You believe in this weird concept of God. That's not a night. That's not a specific God, right? That's a very general category of God. And I, this is probably more my interpre interpretation and not really what Jung doesn't really go outright say this, but I, I think it holds that this opening up of the category of God to just God, like the divine, basically allows archetypes to just pop, just to just wake up, right? Because you've opened that category up to whatever you want it to be, to whatever you feel it is. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, look at who's here. Odin just shows, shows up. Why is Odin here? Well, you kind of stopped being specific. And Odin, being Odin, is very opportunistic, right? And Odin's going to be like, <laughs> Odin is going to do, is Odin is going to do a Taylor Swift. It's me high. I'm the problem. It's me. He's going to just be there. And I, I think that that holds. Um, so I'd be interested in your take on that, Elliot, just a little bit. No, so, a so shower actually, thought I had. And yes, Taylor Swift is part of it. And I like Taylor Swift. So, so just get over it. All right. Okay. I think she's hated. <laughs> So, so actually, I completely agree with you 100%. And I have a, a, a different ways of illuminating this, right? Which please, is to please. say, if you follow, if you follow from Nietzsche, right, who is just a little bit before this time, declaring, declaring, not wishing, 
but observing that God is dead amongst Christians, and Kierkegaard noticed this too. So yeah, it's, it's from both sides. Too. Yep. Right. And and at, why did God die? Well, it's because uh, uh, it's, it's because we we promoted reason over God. Oh, that's a mistake, right? We 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 yeah. promoted the dead word over the living word. Well, we literally made the living word dead, right? Yeah. By by you know. So there you go, right? And 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 you know, to your point earlier, the really confusing thing about our version of monotheism that we have right now is the question is. Uh, who do you believe in God? And that's actually not on the new atheists for taking that framing and running with it. The new atheists correctly point out that it was these extreme monotheists who, who um, killed the category of God, except for just theirs, right? And so when they ask, do you believe in God? They're saying, do you believe in the one that I'm thinking of, right? Whereas in a previous time, it would have been, who are you devoted, devoted to, well, right? And, 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 and what does Christ ask of the uh, disciples? Follow me. Well, no, what does he ask? Who do you say I am? Right. Right. Who right. do you say I am? People. I know that that's not the original Greek, but you that that, that interpretation still works, right? I am. Well, and, and do you say and I what, am? And 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 the correct answer, right, is is I am that I am, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a very that's deep Hebrew yeah. se sentence, right? And right, yeah. and in, in a in a in a in a further sense, right. If and 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 this is kind of the the ultimate point here, right? With I think is where you're getting to with your uh, uh, functional henotheism, right? Is that all of these different gods end up being the identity, right? The thing that does not change, right? right? The the fixed point throughout time and throughout space, the identity. You are an identity, right? Uh, you have several different ident nearly identical states. Every time you go to sleep, you sleep in the same bed. That's an identity. Your body, you, everything is returned to the same state. That's symmetrically speaking, it's identical to where you were at a previous time, right? So, so all of these identities start to emerge out of chaos and confusion. Why? Because God died, right? And it, it, the, the God, the high God, the monotheistic God died, right? The henotheistic highest God died. And well, was replaced well, no, well, by all these other gods. Oh, no, 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 no. The, mon the, mono the monotheistic god died and is replaced by this chaotic henotheistic situation where everyone's competing about who. Well, of course, there's lots of gods, but my god's the best. Well, and, and this is where the monotheists are kind of lying to themselves. They say there is only one god. Well, that's because your god killed all the other gods, but gods don't really die, they sleep, right? So yeah. when your god goes to sleep for a bit, or, 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 or dies, right? All of these other gods start waking up again and saying, oh, hey, it's been a while. What's up, right? Again, and it's high. <laughs> yeah. 100%. And, and, they are a problem. and then they start seeing people. Problem. And we haven't problem. dealt with these gods for centuries. You know, literally we have forgotten the old ways, right? And the old gods, and now they are among us again. And we're totally uh, unable to fight them because uh, we, we, uh, in the Christian world, we've totally abandoned Yahweh, right? Even the even the Christians have, for the most part, well, I right? Think, I think I think um, part of the problem is we we've forgotten. I think a little bit about. Well, again, I mean, you know, Yahweh from a Christian perspective, Yahweh was the unapproachable deity, but it, from a Christian perspective, it's not like you don't have a God man hybrid who's there, right? I think mm -hmm. I think it's that we we of course Christians should care speaking as a Christian. Of course, Christians should care about God, but I think we tend to like we've we've fallen prey to maybe this hyper or this quasi rationalist understanding of like theistic understanding. Of, well, God's just kind of out there. It's like, right? Yeah, but if you're a Christian, supposed to be you right to here. God is incarnate, right? And God is incarnational, and that God, if you're a Christian, God created. If you're a Christian, you have to under you really just have to. It's the only way the theology works. You have to understand the world as incarnational. Most importantly, you have to understand yourself as our incarnation, like God, like God enters into existence and it's not just random, it's for reasons, peeps. And I think that there's this, perhaps it was an attempt to placate the rationalists. I, it's hard to say exactly what happened. It's probably a few different things, lots of different things at once, regardless of that. And people can sit online and argue about the Protestants did it, the Catholics did it. It's like, who... 
Who cares well, at this point? Because it, because it, it was the ending of the e- monastic tradition in my well, mind. But anyway. all you have is each other. It's like all you have is each other. So so get over your bullshit because the rest of the the, the reigning god right now, the reigning gods right now hate you and hate your god, and they kind of want to eat your kids. I really do think that. And and even and even if you're you know again minimum viable religion, even if you're a neo pagan, I don't think all neo pagans, you know, they have their various understandings of God, and it's going to be very different. But I don't think all of them want uh, want to eat the kids. I think it's a certain kind of this like hyper progressive, hyper woke, you know, really ironically new atheist God. They're they kind of just they want to consume. They're very they're very hungry. They're thirsty. Well, Well, it's literally, you know, it's so funny, right? Because all the commies talk about capitalism, right? Um, And and to a right-wing audience, you can't say capitalism, right? Because fair enough. What you really do need to say is techne, technocracy, technism. And and really, honestly, when communists are talking about the capitalism, they they are talking about technism, right? The, 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 objectification if you're if you hear like oh you're objectifying women well they're literally talking about um and it sounds weird to a right winger right because in your mind it's like well yeah it is an object right it's a it's a person object though right but it's like well no 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 the 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 point that people are making and they're not making it well and they're not communicating with you and i'm here to communicate with you on the right wing they are literally saying that uh, and they wouldn't say it like this, but right wingers would say it through stuff like porn. You are treating people right more like objects than they are like people, right? And think about it like this: yeah, like Jackie, you know, Jackie Howard... Treehorn, Jackie Treehorn treats objects like women. <laughs> um, Anyhow, keep going. Right, right, right. So, so, so the um, you know, the the kind of the final point on that tiny point really is is just to say, like, when we're when we're talking about each other as like economic agents, right, and as like when we're thinking about each other more as minds trapped in bodies, right. One of my favorite hymns uh, says, you know, I, I would render thanks and and uh, praise and you know, I I'd, I'd thank God basically. For soul and body strangely joined, right? And we have totally abandoned the soul part of ourselves, right? And and focused entirely on the body mind part. And we're not even unified there, right? Like our bodies and our mind are literally at war with each other. Actively hate the meat space. And it's just, it's so clear. People just really don't give a shit about anything that's like in the real world, like in the physical world. They don't care. And, and of and course, like it, of- it totally makes sense because we don't have the yeah. example of a Christ figure who is yeah. literally inhabiting both worlds. And yeah. by the way, it's not just Christ for, for because there's Prometheus, right? There's other demi the demigods are actually way more important. They're well, not just knockoff brand gods; they're actually the gods that you can contend with, right? Well, and I mean, I mean, this idea of embodied deity is found in a like most for religions. Sure. Maybe not, for not sure. all. It's not in all, but it's in a lot. It's in many, not all, but many. I mean, you can think of like, you know, Krishna and Bhagavad Gita, right? Like you can think of a lot of different things, right? Like the, the embodied divine is a thing. Um, not universal, but it's it's fairly widespread. And maybe, maybe again, regardless of what you believe or you don't believe on a functional level, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe that's mm-hmm. for a reason. Maybe that's for a reason. I'll, I'll maybe end with this as sort of a hyper stupid nerd. That's this channel. Uh, some uh, sort of conclusion. To all the hyper goths out there, think about World of Darkness RPG setting. The technocracy, everyone, the mages, they remove the consensus, the old consensus, and supplant it with their own. And and for the think about it, the, think about for it. For the fantasy nerds, think about Game of Thrones. Right, they remove the old gods and even the the current gods for a singular feminine crazy person god. Right, think about it. Think about it. Right, like lots of pop culture connections here. Yeah, yep. yep. It's 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 screaming at us from every corner. It's right. like yeah, it, it's like it's it's like the stones are crying out, and I mean that in a biblical sense. Like there's something mm-hmm. that's crying out, 
And it's not just crying out just from, you know, Christian and or Jewish sources. It's kind of crying out everywhere. It's almost like it's universal. It's almost like the world is trying to tell us something. So I don't know. It's I will not say, the spirit world. Not the Fuck spirit. That no, that's a little different. The world spirit. Not the Yeah, not that one uh cool well hey that's probably i know it's a little bit it's always hard to end these huge conversations but um i feel like that's that's about as much of an of, of a summarization as it can give highly recommend the article um you know you can i think you can find it pretty easily online uh the translation is good even though they don't translate those handful of german words but i've just tra- you know i've given you the glosses for them so you can you can hack it i think it's okay you can always look it up in a german english dictionary Jung is great I, again i need to read more Jung. But this is, of course, we managed to quote unquote summarize it much longer than it takes to read it. But anyhow, true, true. A, <laughs> a sign of a good work, sign of a good work. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we're going to be entering into a slightly, you know, it's the summertime. Uh, and I got stuff that I'd like to write. Elliot has stuff that he'd like to do. We'll still be having shows. Um, we'll probably be having them slightly less frequently, although maybe every week we'll see. We'll play it out. You know, we've, we've been pretty consistent and consistency is good. But, you know, it's nice to do other things, too. I want to keep, you know, riding on this um, functional henotheism thing. I'd really like to get more stuff written about it and other topics for carpeforum.com. So, um, and Elliot has his stuff, too. So, but with that, you know, so it might be slowing down a bit. But our next episode will be with a very good friend of mine, uh, my friend Matthew. And... Matthew and I will be discussing an article that we wrote and was actually published in a real deal, like academic uh, place, journal, book. And it's all about the Ghostbusters. So whenever the, it's going to, we're going to have to wait a little bit here, but that's okay. Uh, we're slowing down. Ghostbusters is next. And I am incredibly excited because who doesn't love the Ghostbusters? Like be perfectly honest, probably the best movie ever made. Citizen Kane. Yeah, but. Ghostbusters. Come on. <laughs> Ghostbusters. It's a good movie. Who are you going to call? Who are you going to call? Mean, when, who when... are you going to call if not them? So when you there's know, spooks all around. Who are you going to There call? are. And we're out here <laughs> busting the we're busting the spirit of the times. We're busting the spirit of the world, right? We're busting ghosts left and right. Hegelianism just it doesn't stand a chance, right? Because the solution to Hegelianism is Ghostbusters, yeah. The solution to Hegelianism is crossing the streams. That really is. Total protonic reversal. And with that, I'll let everyone go. Elliot, thanks for coming on again. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you. Uh, Elliot, anything you want to bump before we I let you go? I've talked about what I'm planning on doing. Anything new on your end? Doesn't have to be, but I just want to give you space. No, for- I actually do have a new thing. Um, I'm, I'm writing up a little a little video with um, with uh, 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 cybernetics. I'm, I'm using uh, logic gates. Um, to kind of explain some cybernetic stuff. I think it'll be kind of a little fun project and uh, be an extremely concrete way to like simplify and talk through some of the bigger ideas, right? Through some extremely concrete examples that obviously don't really capture the full swath of it, but I think um, allow us to use a a fun little toy model to kind of get the the bigger picture of, of what we're talking about with cybernetics to get very precise because sometimes it can get kind of loosey-goosey like what are what's even being talked about here right well i think that i'm coming up with an, a, a pretty fun um very dry to be honest way of, of doing it so that's that's what i'm working on well i'm looking forward to it because i'm gonna be perfectly honest i only understand about half of what you have to say about cybernetics so concrete examples are good for for, for normies like me so we, we can't all no, be but- mathematicians just exactly right <laughs> all right with that i wish everyone a very wonderful uh weekend and until next time uh be thinking about egregores functional henotheism and ghostbusters all right peace everyone take it easy bye